Hi everyone, uh, Jack the Immigration Attorney here. So I've been hearing a lot about this Biden new executive order about keeping families together. So I thought I would um, pull up the fact sheets from the White House and then we'll read it together and then we will talk about the keywords and what to look out for. So if you're not sure whether you qualify or someone you know might be interested in knowing whether they qualify, then you'll find out through this video. All right, let's get started. So this document is titled Fact Sheet, President Biden Announces New Actions to Keep Families Together. All right, sounds really good. Uh, since his first day in office, President Biden has called on Congress to secure our border and address our broken immigration system. As congressional Republicans have continued to put partisan politics ahead of national security, twice voting against the toughest and fairest set of reforms in decades, blah, blah, blah. So this is all about like just throwing the Republicans under the bus and um, as sort of like a reason why he has this new executive order. Um, for, well, political wise, I'm kind of, I lean towards Republican, but I'm mostly a Democrat. I guess I'm kind of, I'm kind of what you call them in the middle, centrist. I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. Whatever gets the system working is what I want. All right. So these wonderful things that he has done includes in implementing executive actions to bar migrants who cross the southern border unlawfully from receiving asylum when, when encounters are high. So this is just a way of saying, I'm not letting anyone in. I'm just letting uh, people who follow the rules into the United States. So it kind of counters against this impression of lawlessness, I guess. Deploying record numbers of law enforcement, personnel, infrastructure, and technology to the southern border. Seizing record amounts of fentanyl at our ports of entry. Revoking visas of CEOs and government officials outside of the U.S. who profit from migrants coming to the United States unlawfully. This is the first I've heard of this, <laughs> okay. Um, expanding efforts to dismantle human smuggling networks and prosecuting individuals who violate immigration laws. All right. Now, President Biden believes that securing the border is essential. He also believes in expanding lawful pathways and keeping families together and that immigrants who blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is just all talking about what he's done and then like he's had like, you know, he helped, he, he has something to do with DACA, which is now kind of like, you know, uh, a program that is on its way out or something. But he's trying to recreate this DACA moment from like the Obama period, where I think that really won Obama a lot of points. So Biden's like, hmm, maybe I should do the same. But obviously DACA is dead, so he's going to have to find something else. So now comes this keeping family together uh, benefit. Uh, in, in essence, I, what I've heard is that um, if you enter the U.S. without inspection, generally you would have to go back to your home country and apply for the immigrant visa there. So in leaving the country and coming back, there's a lot of risks because what if you get denied? You might become separated from your family for a long time. And that is a risk that a lot of um, people don't want to take because, you know, they got kids and wife and husbands in the United States. So going out of the country and not being able to return carries substantial risks for those people. So they would rather not go out of the United States and apply for the green card from within the United States. But the law currently doesn't allow that unless there's some exceptions, of course. And I think Biden is trying to fit this executive order into one exception called the parole in place. So currently the parole in place applies to like military spouses, military children. So like if you have something to do with the military, then um, if you're a family member of a military, then you can potentially qualify to do your green card from within the United States and not have to go outside the country. So I think that they're just adding this new, like, okay, executive order under the PIP, uh, the parole in place. Because before, a while, a while ago, PIP was also, I think, sort of created by, uh, by one of the presidents just so that, you know, the military spouses don't have to be separated. So... It's nothing unheard of. It's just fitting another, it's uh, not fitting, but adding another option under an existing program so that some people who otherwise qualify for the green card can do it from within the United States. So this is nothing new. It's not like creating a new, brand new category for everyone to get a green card. 
No, uh, uh, no, there is no such new category, and the president is not authorized to create any new categories. They can only use existing programs and add to it. So they're saying, okay, right now, uh, there is the PIP program, P parole in place, that benefits military families. So why don't we add one more um, type of people into that program, which is which are the people who've been here for 10 years and, 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 and you know, qualifies under all the eligibility requirements. And we're gonna talk about what they are, obviously. So that's why we're here. All right, so continuing. Um, keeping American families together. Today, President Biden announces that uh, the Department of Homeland Security will take action to ensure that US citizens with non-citizen spouses and children can keep their families together. So this will apply to spouses and children, uh, not parents, unfortunately. So spouses and children, those are the categories. This new process will help certain non-citizen spouses. So the keyword is certain, not all, not all non-citizen non -citizen children, certain, um, apply for lawful permanent residence, status that they have already been eligible for, or they, they are already eligible for, so that's another key word. You have to already been eligible for the green card, and this is just allowing you to do the green card from within the United States instead of having to go outside the country, that's all. So it's not like a new category, it's not amnesty. There is no new category being created, giving status to people who are otherwise not eligible. It's not like that at all. Because what, what the calls that I get a lot from other people is like, oh, this is amnesty, this is outrageous. How can they do this? How can they like let people pass those legal immigrants ahead of lines? Well, not really that. And also this only covers maybe like half a million people in the United States. That's a small group. I mean, compared to all the illegal Im uh, immigrants here, exceeding probably <clears throat> 11 million at this, at this time. You know, and sorry, I'm using the word illegal alien just, just sort of, I, I, I don't, I mean, there's been a lot of changes, non-citizens, you, you know, we can't even call someone undocumented. I just want to make things simple. And if you don't have status, I can call you undocumented, I can call you illegal immigrants, whatever people understand. So if I fi if you find me politically incorrect, I'm sorry, I apologize for that in advance, but that's not really the point here. So um, let's see, uh, where are we? This new process, will help certain non-citizen spouses and children apply for lawful permanent residence status that they are already eligible for without leaving the country. So that's all, without leaving the country. So, oh, I'm gonna post this link to this document in underneath it, so you don't have to like scramble to find it. So if you find it hard to follow, look to the comments first, find the documents, we can read it together. In order to be eligible, non-citizens, um, that's another word for illegal immigrants, uh, must, as of June 17, 2024, so, June 17th, 2024 is the deadline. Like if you're gonna get married, get married before or June 27th. Oh my God, that's like now. Wait, when it was, June 19th. Okay, wow, that's like eight days. Okay, so you have eight days to get married to a US citizen to meet this deadline. Okay, so I think the wedding chapels are gonna be quite busy uh, in the next few weeks. Okay, then, um, and have resided in the United States for the 10, for 10 or more years. Okay, so this is another hard requirement. You have to have lived in the United States for 10 years. What does that mean? Because you, somebody could say, hey, I lived in the United States for 10 years, but I think the difficulty is to prove it. How do you prove it? Well, you could prove it through tax returns, bank statements, credit cards, school records, um, job records, or maybe declarations from people who can can vouch that you've been here for the last 10 years, birth of kids or um, getting married, things that happen in the United States over the years can help you prove that you've been here for 10 years. And obviously if we draw on our experiences from the past, they're not gonna ask you to prove that every single day you are here. So if you have, let's say, you know, like a cell phone, uh, Bill for the last five years, that should probably do it for the last five years, even though, you know, you could be like sneaking, sneaking back to home country for like a few days and come back, theoretically, but obviously they're not going to, you know, um, be able to, I guess, get people on that. But um, so you just have to think about some reasonable proof that can show that you were here, you have been here for 10 years before you um, apply for this benefit. While, and then, uh, for, so lived in the United States for 10 or more years and be legally married to a US citizen. Okay, that, that's another requirement. Uh, while satisfying all applicable legal requirements. 
on average, those who are eligible for this process have resided in the United States for 23 years. I'm just like, how do they know that? Like, where did this statistic come from? Like, it seems so, so random. Like, how do you know it's 23 years? Um, I, mean, I don't know, but I guess nobody cares. All right. <clears throat> those who are approved after DHS case-by-case -case assessment. Keyword, again, case-by-case. -case. What does that mean? Case-by-case -case means if I don't like you, I don't have to give it to you. That's what that means. So, for example, oh, you have a DUI. Uh, for example, oh, you um, didn't pay taxes for a while. Or, hey, you know, you don't pay your child support. Hey, you, you know, uh, there, there will be some reasons for the DHS to say no to, to your um, application. So it's case by case assessment uh, of their application and will be afforded a three year period to apply for permanent residency. Now, I think that's kind of vague. Uh, afforded, so be given a three year period. So do they get like an approval notice that says with this paper, you're legal here for three years? That's probably how they're going to do it. Like on some kind of I-797 that says, hey, you're legal here now for three years. And with that paper, you could probably apply for a work permit. Now the question arises, people are going to ask, can I apply for the work permit with uh, you know, the application and not have to wait the, for the three year thing to be approved? I don't know. So those are all good questions. So usually when you have a new immigration policy like this, it raises more questions than it answers, and we'll have to wait for immigration to come out and tell us what um, what they have in mind uh, exactly with this three-year period to apply for permanent residency. So that means they get to charge you, the applicants, not you, charge the applicants twice. First, I think, charge you for the three-year period, and then charge you for the green card. So then they kind of like double dibs on the filing fees, which, I don't know, generates more money for USCIS, and God knows that they need it. So, all right. Um, uh, okay, so be allowed to remain in, in, with their families in the United States and be eligible, be eligible for work authorization for up to three years. Okay. This will apply to all married couples who are eligible. Why do they add this sentence at the end of this paragraph? What does that add? This will apply to all married couples who are eligible. I mean, isn't that a given? Isn't that, isn't that assumed? So, but I, I feel like this sentence is somewhat cryptic. Like it's trying to tell you something, but then doesn't come out and say it. This, maybe I'm thinking too much about it. This will apply to all married couples who are eligible. Okay, so we already know the eligibility. So of course it's going to apply only to the people who are eligible. So restating the sentence, you know, I, I think I'm, over, I'm overthinking it. So let's just move on. This action will protect approximately half a million spouses. So what they means is that not everyone's going to, maybe like only a small portion of people are going to be eligible for this. Um, under the age of... Uh, uh, Sorry, half a million spouses of U.S. citizens and approximately 50,000 non-citizen children under the age of 21 whose parents is married to a U.S. citizen. So this not only applies to spouses, also children. Like if, I, if I'm under 21 and my parent is married to a U.S. citizen, I would also benefit as well. So, it's, so the beneficiaries could be half a million plus 50,000 people, which is still a really small amount of number considering you know, that the uh, non-citizens currently living in the United States who don't have legal status probably exceeded 10 million people. So this is a really small fraction um, of, of people. Not, not super small, but it's small enough. So, um, yeah. And then it goes into the next section with easing the visa process for U.S. college graduates, including dreamers. I read it and it's like, okay, super vague. Like, I, it doesn't say anything about what applications or whether they have to leave the United States. But the fact that they use visas implies that they have to go outside the country and apply at the U.S. consulate because only U.S. consulates can issue visas. So what if what if those what about those people who are already here in the U.S.? Are there options to change status or do something within the U.S.? Doesn't say. So, um, well, that. So I think that's gonna that's intentionally kept vague. Now um, back to this keeping families together situation. So we talked about uh, ten. So there's ten years, and also I got a call like for example from someone who said ten years ago um, 
my husband uh, entered the United States, tried to enter the United States, and he got caught. He was fingerprinted, uh, and you know, at the border when they catch you, they take your fingerprints, and then he, he and then they send him back. And now he's in the U.S. So what does that tell me? That tells me that after he got sent back, he tried entering again, and this time he wasn't caught. Now by doing that, it creates like a permanent bar, uh, which means that you're inadmissible to the United States, and also. You know, he, if you use someone else's documentation to enter the United States, that's also another bar. So those are going to be definitely considered, I believe, in the case by case um, uh, assessment. So now it creates this competing question like, OK, you have to be eligible for the green card. So for those who enter the United States without without uh, inspection and got caught and re-entered again, they're actually not eligible for the green card. So this executive order wouldn't cover them, even if they lived in the United States for 10 years now and also has U.S. citizen spouse. So this gives rise to other questions, like what about criminal convictions that write you off? Because some criminal convictions are not in eligibility problems, while others are. For example, like trespassing as a criminal uh, offense is is not uh, does not render you ineligible for a green card, but murdering someone does. So obviously, you know, it, this case by case assessment would apply to trespassing, but not apply to uh, a serious crime like murder because you know uh, murder writes you off. So eligibility, I think, is going to be like the key criteria. You cannot be inadmissible. Uh, under any existing immigration laws, except for being out of status. So this essentially, I guess, waives the three-year and the 10-year bar, but it actually doesn't because it doesn't say anything about that. It, it, it says you have to be eligible. So perhaps you still have to file the three-year and the 10-year bar uh, waiver, the unlawful presence waiver, that's what we call it. But under the current PIP program, you don't have to file a waiver. So all of these are somewhat confusing and unanswered questions for me. But, you know, as we get answers in the next uh, month or two, I'm definitely going to be able to find uh, what I'm looking for, the answers to my questions. So, so far, th this leaves me with some questions, but it's definitely a great gr direction, great you know, direction in the right way, I think. Because, you know, I really believe in protecting the dreamers and people who've been here for a long time, especially those who were brought here when they were young and they had no choice. Because, you know, not uh, giving those people status would just, um, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I think this is a, a right move in the right direction, of course. Uh, when I have more, I will definitely come back and tell you. All right, so uh, for now, uh, feel free to join our Facebook group and send me a message if you have any questions, and then we can continue our conversations there. Thank you. Have a good day.